Welcome to The Wild Tech Show. I'm your host, Liam. Today, we've got Sean Perry, writer, director, producer of Dash, a one-take film, which comes out later this year. We discuss how he made this film and what the process was like, how he got into filmmaking and what he's doing in the future moving forward. I hope you enjoy the show. As always, if you could like, subscribe and hit that notification bell. And let's get into it. Hi, Sean. How are you doing? You all right? Liam, I'm doing well. How are you, man? Yeah, good, man. Good. Dash, i uh, seen the trailer. It looks good. Cool. Excited. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's no, good. I wanted to know when uh, when this is looking likely it's going to come out. I think originally they planned on December, but they actually just pushed it up to November. So like probably late November, okay. around Thanksgiving time, they're going to, yeah, you'll be able to stream it somewhere. Is there any links that I can provide for them or? Yeah. Ugh. I mean, as of now, it's kind of out of our hands, which is cool yeah. and kind of a different realm for us. <laughs> but I mean, it's all on XYZ. So I mean, if you follow XYZ, their website or their Instagram or whatever, cool. yeah, like they'll be releasing all that information. Cool. And I'm cool. I'm glad you got to see the trailer because I know that they've removed that because they want to do like a grand release of the full trailer. Oh, right. So well, I'm glad yeah. you got to see the trailer. Yeah, I think I found it on uh, Instagram. Uh, I think it was on oh, Instagram cool. somewhere. So how how did it come about? Was it the idea to shoot a one take film first, or was it you wrote the script and then came up with the idea to like do it in one take? For sure, I think you know we we were both. I mean, I've been making films since I was a young teenager, and yeah. just the frustration of dealing with the studio system and pitching and yeah. waiting to hear you know waiting to be given a yes, and you know that was never my mentality to wait around. Okay. So I think, you know, we were, it, COVID happened, we were pitching a project for a year and we're like, if we're going to Los Angeles, man, like I'm not going to wait around, but just shoot something right away. Yeah. So I think from there, inherently the, the one take structure in a car seemed like it will remove a lot of the costs and added a lot of other extraneous stresses, but it definitely helped with reducing the cost. Yeah. It's a difficult one because, you know, shooting maybe 12, 10 minutes on a, on one take is, is, you know. It's okay, it's doable, but you know, like what is it, 105 minutes, 107 minutes? Yeah, I, I think the runtime is 107 minutes, but the credit sequence yeah. is time lapse, so it's actually like a t- damn near two hour runtime, wow. which is wild, man. Wild, that's insane. And 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 again, so you've literally got kind of this one take of, of the whole process. Mm. So, how, how many times did you have to do the this take, this, this one for shot? sure. And that was kind of the beauty of, uh, you know, my producing partner, Alex and the star, he comes from a theater background. So oh. having oh. him. Yeah. So like he's used to like acting in that form, which is very helpful yeah. for him and helpful for all of us. But we really approached, you know, other theater actors who were used to doing this kind of thing. Yeah. And a lot of the people that are in the film have been on Broadway or off Broadway. So they're, they're great theater actors and good friends of mine. Uh, but then we also hired a, a stage, a stage manager who was like a production manager. And she was oh. kind of, running the logistics of you're in here you're out there timing keeping like we had three cars involved i know you've been on stuff like uh snl i believe you've done some like acting as well haven't you so like, yeah uh, i mean like it's you, not really my primary driving force i'm not much of an actor i do act in dash but that's out of necessity but yeah, yeah i did do like the snl thing for a while i was yeah. uh i moved to new york and was like still trying to write and direct but if i could also act like if that was another way in why not but yeah. then snl ended up using me as like their shirtless dude they made the shirtless guy they would call me in just yeah. real, it was like a surreal experience yeah i can imagine it was how many times did you have to go through this process um with film? yeah so we rehearsed like for a month leading up to this so like everything because we knew just based on cost we kind of scheduled it out that we had three nights to give this a try i mean we could push for a fourth but i mean rental costs use the weekend rentals so you only paid for you know a day so like yeah we had three tries we had a friday saturday and sunday and this pray to god and cross our fingers and luckily we got it that's amazing so the sound the camera lenses all that was rented as well for sure. I did have, I mean, I have, uh, you know, a GH4, which I don't know if you know anything about cameras. Like I've always loved that camera. And originally that was the plan. Like we're just do the super cheap, man. Like we'll use yeah. my camera. I have that. Let's do it. And then we started having other actors read. And they're like, this could be pretty good, man. And I'm like, all right, let's chill out and, you know, rent the camera. Yeah. But then we've gotten to the issue of, you know, the GH4 with the compression ratio, we could shoot two hours continuously, no problem. But we shot on a red helium 8K, which is a massive file size. So yeah. I didn't think that, I didn't even know, like, and luckily, you know, at the time that we shot, uh, some company, I think over in England, came out with a, a two terabyte card that we could shoot 8K, like a seven to one compression ratio. And uh, 
yeah, thank God. Because like, even like I said, with the two hour runtime, I think we could fit a maximum of two hours and five minutes. And like I said, our runtime was about two hours. So like if we missed the turn or hit a stoplight, man, it was pushing wow. it. It was cutting it really close. Right? I think, you know, because we, we do nothing about Los Angeles. I mean, dude, like the original draft of the script, like they were going to Beverly Hills, they were going to Santa Monica. <laughs> and then realistically, it's like they can go three blocks off Hollywood Boulevard. That's about it. You know, like we couldn't right. go too far. But luckily, Alex, you know, he was very ambitious. So he not only had to memorize those lines, but, you know, we, we found the visuals based on reflections that I liked. Mm. And then, you know, also opportune places for our actors to hop in and out. But yeah, I mean, he rehearsed that route every single day for like a month, like every day, every day, nonstop. So he, he got to the point where I was just like in the back of his memory. He didn't have to think about it much. Yeah. He could focus on performance. But yeah, man, like logistically, I'll have to send you the map because like it was... Yeah, it was very well planned and very like yeah. meticulously rehearsed because it was COVID, man. So like everybody had time. So luckily, if people were willing to put in rehearsal time, and yeah, yeah. so because there's like you said, there's anything that could happen at any given moment and any given night. So luckily, our actors were very prepared. They were well rehearsed and kind of knew how to roll with the punches. So this this was shot through COVID, then? Did you say as well? Was it? When, yeah, when it, yeah. So you really took the opportunity. So we and that's kind of why we thought it could work is like, uh, you know, the streets were much more barren than they previously were. The traffic yeah. was way down, especially at nighttime. But yeah. what was crazy, and like that's what we were trying to rush, because we shot, I think, March of 2020, 2020 I, I'm getting all years mixed up now, but we shot it in, I think, March, yeah, of last right. year, I guess. And uh, I think, where was it going with this? I think, uh, oh, yeah. So that's what I was going to say is that they actually, LA reopened bars the, the weekend we started shooting. Right. So they've been, bars have been closed for, you know, a year almost. And yeah. then they reopened the weekend we were shooting, which we were so afraid about. But luckily it didn't impact us too much, but it did change the route. Like it changed the timing of things. There were more cars. Yeah. Which is wild. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Did you guys grade it afterwards? Kind of, did you put it on any software and grade it? Um, there's no editing i suppose you just have to watch it back i know dude, yeah work, so. yeah Trust that's me. and i i believe me there was a couple moments that i could have cut and i really wanted to but it was like stick to your guns like let's not yeah. Yeah. but i say i did all the editing and like it's funny because it didn't seem like there'd be much editing but i don't know if you, i guess in the trailer doesn't show up but it, there's a lot of text messages and phone calls i saw some of that yeah yeah that's kind of like a, another character in the film and those animations which i did myself just took so long man because there's so many of them and i had to cut out like there's a couple of reflections i had to cut out and replace and just stuff like that luckily yeah. i know how to do but it just it was so time consuming and you know, i'll have to send you like a, we have a little behind the scenes feature i'll send it to you so you can kind of see what i'm talking about but uh, oh, that'd be cool man yeah definitely it, yeah it was also i was also the dp and i know i, I know enough to like the scene but you know, I like a scene with so many different people coming in and out and skin tones. And like, it was a nightmare, but the way I had to light Alex, the driver, his, like whenever he had his hand on the steering wheel, yeah, the light was blasting on there, man. So the first, the first screening I had, my DP friend was like, man, I hate to tell you his hand's too hot. So yeah. for a two hour movie, dude, I had to go through a rotoscope around his hands and adjust the exposure and shadows and highlights in it. That was a month of my life, man. of just wow. frame by frame editing as, yeah, it took, Forever, That's coloring as well. Did you use uh, Avid, uh, uh, DaVinci Resolve, After I'm Effects? A big, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. a big After After Effects guy, so yeah. like I inherently have to kind of use Premiere. Yeah, I, After Effects is an awesome program, and like with yeah. that, I, I'm pretty well versed, so I can fix just about anything. But I mean. I, that's kind of why I was late for you know the initial call. Is I just got I finally got a new computer, man, because I edited oh, okay. that entire film on a 2010 Mac Pro, which is so stupid. I would not. I mean, dealing with 8K footage on a 2000, and I, and I had to read because like, yeah. like I couldn't even watch the dailies because like I don't my computer doesn't even have a USB like three chip. Yeah. Like I had it took 18 hours to drop the footage. So like. Jeez. Imagine so I had to rebuild my computer from scratch just to be able to watch this stuff, and it's pretty god that we got it. What about the script? So how how did that come about? How did I, that they, I, I mean, it's funny because I think a lot of I've been asked that question before. Where they're like, "Oh, how influenced were you by Taxi Driver and this and that?" And I'm like, the only influence we had, man, was making a movie. That was that's yeah. what it was. I knew that we yeah. had one car, and you know that that was a challenge to me as a writer because that's I think I pride my like that's what I spend my most of my time doing is writing. Right. So I think okay. it was a challenge to me of like how can you tell an engaging story in one location without camera movement and like that's 
Well, it's a challenge, man. But so I think that's where the idea spawned from is I knew I wanted a rideshare driver, Hollywood, one car, go. That's all it was. And like, how do you keep these people engaged? How can yeah. you make it happen? How how did the funding come about for you? Was it a case of you just asked for fit favors and, and just, or was it like you had a budget and that's what you worked with? Obviously you rented the equipment and whatnot. So yeah. Do you finance that yourself? What was the process there? If you, if you, if you don't want to speak completely about it, that's self. Completely self financed, man. Yeah. Funded it ourselves. Just me and my producing partner, Alex. Yeah. Which he's probably going to piss that I'm saying this on camera. But yeah, he lived in his van. I mean, he was living in his van in Santa Monica when this was happening. So, like, we had no money. We had no money, man. And we had, like I said, I don't want to, I'm going to try to keep that a secret as far as how much we paid for it. But I will say that is, you know, originally, you can see that poster up there, the El Mariachi poster. That was the inspiration. It was not cross that line. And I think we, yeah, we, it was very, very low, very, That's very cool. low budget. And like I said, all of our actors were friends that, you know, all deferred pay. Yeah. Which now that's something uh, we have to deal with, you know, SAG now and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, all deferred pay, people just believing in the project. And so budgetarily, I think the biggest thing was probably just, you know, renting a camera. And camera rentals in Los Angeles, especially, are so cheap. So, so and then we rented, we rented the red and the, like, we shot on the Cook Anamorphic lens. And, uh, I think total it was under thousand dollars to rent that stuff for the weekend, which is just insane. Yeah, that is really good. renting stuff now is so cheap. It's great. I love it. Yeah, with the sound, how how did you go about that with this? Was this all done sort of internal? And so you had a mic in the car. Um, did you do ADR? What was the process there? So that was the only person that was paid on set was the sound guy. We hired a great sound guy, oh, and he move. rigged that that car up with like with six microphones. There was microphones yeah. everywhere. Uh, Smart move. but that was a big thing that I learned is like, as it, I always, I, that's the one thing of the production process. That I don't really know much about is sound. Yeah. And that's, we did spend a chunk of money I, after it was started to get some, some traction. We're like, okay, we might have something here. Then we hired on a fantastic, uh, sound engineer and they uh-huh. just, they, they ev- just elevated the project to a whole other level, which yeah. I thought, like I said, man, I thought like what you record and what you heard, like that's what it is. Mm-hmm. But no, man, like he, he was so good and like just blew my mind with what he was able to accomplish. Yeah. Cause it does. Like that's the one, like, if you watch this movie, like a surround sound setting, it's, it'll blow your face off. Man. Yeah. It's great. The amount of effort and time that goes into it is, it's a whole, it's all another process in itself. So absolutely, man. Yeah. And those sound engineers, like those re-recording mixers, they're, just as particular as any filmmaker is yeah. so like they're listening frame by frame just to make sure everything is perfect and yeah that was where the money was well well spent because like i said man i was that was so late in the process that we hired this guy so i was watching fade in and the first line i'd be god man it just doesn't sounds off sounds off and then mm-hmm. like i said that was a year of watching that project and then having having hearing his new mix it's like oh my god finally like yeah he made it happen just click. It just, yeah made it a movie finally it yeah really, really really did how, how did you get into filmmaking had you studied in like school college what was the process there with you how how did you come about this i think yeah i just grew up always loving movies and yeah. i think you know what there was a couple movies that watching when i was in my teens that were you know like because i was big inspired by kevin smith and you know rodriguez like that generation of like just go out and do it yeah and watching those movies like, oh man okay we can do this so i think i started making shitty terrible moves with my friends at a very very young age cool and then like like then going to the university it was like okay i, I think i'll be a film major yeah. and then you get there and like when i went to college it was like that awkward time frame where the professors that have been there for 20 years they knew all about cutting on film but not much about like those final cut pro at the time they didn't know right. much about that like yeah. us up and coming kids you were watching youtube videos like we knew how to cut on final cuts so i think yeah. i drive change majors like two years in i'm like i don't want to pay for you know this person that doesn't, doesn't exactly know what they're doing to teach me mm-hmm. a new technology where i can teach myself it was actually an econ major and then but kept making movies while studying you know economics yeah and then after graduation like i remember going to a bus to a career fair like to get a banking job and i was writing a script at the time i'm like I got on the bus, got, I didn't never got off the bus. I went right back to my apartment and then never went to the career fair and just yeah. start, started writing my script because I knew right away that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make movies and I was going to do it myself. So I spent like 10 years in my twenties, just spending every dollar I had to make, you know, short films, yeah. like try to pitch them. And that was like, that's just always the mentality. Like I said, go out and do it yourself. Again, so there's like 10 years of rejection and like terrible movies, but just we learn, I learned so much. And especially where I'm from, 
I'm from Western Pennsylvania originally, like the middle of nowhere. There's right. nobody in the industry around there. So I, that's kind of why I had to teach myself how to do all these things. Yeah. Because nobody else, and my friends, like they're just great people. They don't really yeah. care about filmmaking. We just yeah. get some beers and make a movie. Like, that's what you did. It was- yeah. You're, you're right up there now. Um, I think that's cool to see as well because a lot of people spend too much time on, I, I've done it myself, looking at what cameras do I need? What, what That was me for years, man. I did that yeah. forever. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I mean, because we asked that earlier, like inspiration for the project. And I think a big inspiration for that was to prove, granted, we did shoot on a red helium, which is a great camera, but to show it, to make a good movie, you don't need all these extravagant materials and like in dollies and cranes and this and that and drones. It's like, there's no camera movement in this entire movie. It's yeah. a locked frame. And like, that was what I wanted to prove to me. If I want to prove to myself and to an audience that like, you can still tell a great story and that's the biggest thing that would make a good movie is a great story. A hundred percent. And again, to be fair, I'd notice in the um, posters in the background. So you point out the El Marachi, mm-hmm. but same with Evil Dead. Oh, no, yeah. Um, yeah, love it. Yep, love that's nice. Yeah. And yeah. I think I got the shirt on too, oh, the second one. Yeah, yeah big, brilliant. Big brilliant. Sam Raimi. I think that was a, a huge inspiration. I made horror movies all throughout my 20s, man. Like Sam oh. Raimi was, he was 20 years old when he did Evil Dead. It's like, that was to me, like not a, a competition, but like, okay, if he could do that when he was 20, like there was nothing stopping me. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned you mentioned Romero because yeah. I, I said I'm from Western Pennsylvania and that's kind of where Romero is from. He's from Pittsburgh. So oh. Towards the end of my like stay in Western PA before I moved to New York, I was making all these horror films and I actually reached out to a makeup artist who was a part of the Savini Makeup School. Oh, so like my, the the last two films I made back in like I said the middle of nowhere Pennsylvania, I was able to like I was able to truck a bunch of kids up from the Savini Makeup School to do makeup on our movies, which is that's wild amazing. to bring a crew from like it's from Pittsburgh up to our small town. Like, that's cool. Town, I'm loving it. It's so that cool. is wicked. Was it just you? You had a group of friends, and it was just you came up with the ideas and and you made it. Do you have writing partners? Is it kind of you, you just put stuff together and then find a team as and when? With the previous projects, yeah. smaller projects. Oh, with the with the previous project, I said no. None of my friends. They were just very. They're just. They, they wanted to hang out. That's Enthusiastic. All they and, yeah. Yeah. They were just like, okay, man, like you're crazy. We'll make another movie for you as long as you give us beer. So that's what it was. Like you had to have beer on set. And like, yeah, they'll yeah. have fun. They don't care. Yeah, cool. But then you know, it, it, increasingly year by year, I started taking it more seriously. Yeah. I started trying to get more ambitious, which kind of made them less fun and more just especially not asking your friends to do work really like, just to help out. Like it ended up turning into a lot. And that's why I think it's like, okay, it's time to branch out and try somewhere else. But I mean, yeah, I, I, as long as, yeah, you can have your friends do anything, but you know, if you yeah. keep pushing and pushing and pushing and try to get better as a filmmaker, inevitably you're going to, you know, push a yeah. little too much. I think to me, it's, it's really surreal to be asked these questions because I've been that guy that's been lurking on forums and watching interviews like this for years. Yeah. So like, I'm so excited to be taught, like telling my story. Not that it's that much more interesting, but just like to give kids inspiration. Like you can do it, man. Like yeah, truly, you can do it. You've you've made this film now. It's been picked up by X Y Z. It's a big company. Mm-hmm. I've seen some of their films. They you know they've got like the platform and wild. Yeah, yeah. So that 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 experience, like what? How was that experience for you? Um, and what was the process in that sense? Did you shop it around? Was it picked up at a festival? for sure yes because this is like i mean these are questions that i asked you know for decades to try to get the right answers to yeah and so there's always more than one route like our route is very i get it's not underwhelming but it's it's a different approach i guess so we you know the film was getting in the film festivals uh not the major ones of course like i'm not even mentioning their names the big boys want nothing to do with us and uh well, we got into like Dance with Films, which is a great film festival yeah uh and then cinequest which is a great film festival and then, you know, from that, you know, people got to see the trailer and they would request screeners. And then some of these like smaller distribution companies were like, yeah, we would love to distribute your film. And it's like, uh, so Alex and I, my partner, were like, okay, let's pump the brakes. Let's hold off. We don't yeah. know what's going to happen. Not that, I mean, because we, we're realists. We know what our film is. Like I said, there's one take, well, no camera movement. Like we get it. No name actors. Like we can't be too ambitious, but let's hold off. Let's pump the brakes. And then we actually sent out a press release for dances with films and xyz was one of those recipients right and like i said we probably had maybe six or so offers from other minors like very like respectable distributors but yeah it, it wasn't necessarily lucrative for our, for our 
our sake. And then, you know, XYZ requested a screener. They saw the trailer. They like that. And yeah, James from XYZ just loved the movie. He's ecstatic about it. And it was, it just blew my mind. So it's something, it was a blind press release that we sent out ourselves and that yeah. got their attention. They liked the trailer that made them want to watch the film. And then luckily he watched it one, he was actually, I think at Tribeca the film festival. Okay. And he got COVID. He got COVID and he's like, man, I was locked in my hotel room. Couldn't go to the festival. And then I, I got to watch your movie and I fucking loved it. So like that, it was the That's time we got so lucky and like just, there's a lot of different things that came into play that made mm. this happen. But like, I'm just so grateful that finally luck is in our favor. You put so much time and effort of and of your life and sacrifice probably a lot of other things that you could have gone down uh, for this one thing. So, you know, I think it does come back around full circle eventually um, when you find it. And it's, and it's funny you say that because like I was always telling myself that because that's, I mean, I've lived in Los Angeles almost two years and I've been locked into this room for almost two years right. telling myself that it's going to pay off. But at the same time, in the back of your head, it's like, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years, 15 years yeah. and nothing's really bit. So I think like trying to stray, uh, stray, stray away from that in the back of your mind was a challenge, but like, yeah, just keep going and not stopping. Like, that was the biggest thing. I mean, dude, X, XYZ's last, like, most recent release has Russell Crowe in it. <laughs> it's like, then there's our little movie. It's like, that's just so strange to me. But like, Massive. the people that do watch it and are willing to give a chance, they do gen like, they genuinely enjoy it, which is so great. And like, it's such a great feeling, man. Like, watching it in the theater with people, it's so, it's surreal. It's great. Have you got other scripts in mind now? Um, are you have you already got representation as well for, for, as an agent or as a manager? Yeah, mm -hmm. what, what, what's that process look like for you? I mean, it's been to be honest, man. Like it's been kind of a whirlwind of the last two months between X Y Z stuff and having I have to give them all their deliverables. Like that takes I'm doing that all myself too. That takes a long time. Uh, but as far as like creatively, uh, a lot of people that some of the people that have seen Dash via festivals or screeners, like they're they've been impressed enough to ask me to kind of hop on and do some writing stuff for them. So like oh. there's I, the NDA, NDA type stuff that I've, I've been working on like the last month that I'm excited about, but yeah, man, I have, I mean, I said, I love writing. That's my thing. Yeah. And I think that this, if anything, this project kind of burnt me out of trying to wear 30 different hats on a project. It's yeah. like, it's just, it gets to be exhausting. Like before it was fun. And now it's just like doing so much. It just, it gets to be stressful. So I think I, I would like to spend some time just, I have some scripts that I would like to revisit, but I have some other ideas that I'm also trying to crank out too. Uh, but I like to sit back and just write and wait and not necessarily try to do a project like this again. Not that I'm, a, I'm above it or anything, but just the level of stress. I like to kind of play things out and uh, spend some time writing, see yeah. who's going to who's gonna bite and uh, hopefully make a project the real way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just to have a, have a crew. That's been the goal yeah. for so many years, man, just to have a team that can help you do all these things. So I think then it would be enjoyable. It'd be much more enjoyable. Is there any genres that you were looking to kind of focus on or have you got kind of a mixture of scripts that you kind of want to try out? Yeah, I think, you know, like in the 20s, it was like I wrote nothing but horror. I mean, that was my thing. That was my thing. Not that I've grown out of that. I just think where I am in my life and the life I have been living, I think I just want to tell different stories for the time being where when you watch Dash, you'll see it's like a thriller, but there's some... Sp like speckles of comedy which i love but like realistic genuine comedy and moments of tension i i found that i just love tension much more than i ever thought i would and yeah. trying to craft stories like that mm -hmm. but i think i'll be telling you know for the next couple of years i'll be telling more dramatic thrilling oh, uh, cool. tense kind of stories which is yeah. something i never thought i would get into but like i the, the stories that i've been writing are bigger in scope but they're still simplistic in nature. I think a lot of them are essentially one location. Like the one that I'm really excited about now, it's about like, cause like where I'm from in Western Pennsylvania, we did a lot of deer hunting and it's okay. about one group of guys at a deer camp and, uh, and trying to build tension and tension and tension until it explodes. Yeah. And that's got some good feedback so far. So, oh, cool. but also like I said, I think so I've, I've loved recently as far as writers go, like Taylor Shaler, Sheridan, just killing it. You know, Taylor Sheridan, like Hell or High Water, uh, he's doing Yellowstone. Taylor Sheridan. Uh, Taylor Sheridan, yeah. Um, no, I don't think I've. No, I don't think. In, I've... in this, he's yeah, he just done some like uh, Sicario was a big one he did too. Like he's oh, blown up. All right, okay, he's, yeah, yeah, I I know that. He was an actor who came out of nowhere and just cranked out script after script, and but his, the aesthetic he has is like 
the blue collar American hardworking man. But that's kind of my aesthetic too. But I'm also like, those are, I, I was surrounded by those people my entire life. They're not so one sided and only like robotic. Yeah. I like, like sprinkle in the comedy that so some of the guys are the funniest guys I've ever met in my life. So, like, those stories of surrounding people like that and that, you know, those also they don't really make many Hollywood movies about that part of the country. Billy Wilder, you're familiar with him at all? Billy Wilder, yeah, yeah, writer? yeah, yeah, yeah. So like they always have said that like, him because he could write in so many different genres. Like mm-hmm. you know, which genre do you prefer? What kind of story do you prefer? And his answer is a good one. Yeah. So I think that's kind of where I'm from. Is like there's so I love all genres of films. So like yeah. I'd like to tack all of them eventually. You yeah. not be stuck into one, but yeah, you never know. And I remember when uh, when Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was coming out, or like it was announced that it was being made. The forums were saying that it was going to be a horror film. And I'm like, yes, I would yeah. love to see him try to tackle a horror film. Right. And obviously that's not what it ended up being. But I think because it went back to horror, I think it's just such a challenging genre. It really, really is. And people don't have the nerves to tackle such like a beloved, scary genre. So, like the horror audience are the kind of people that are on Reddit. I just <laughs> parade people. So it's like, dude, like, okay, yeah. I get it. Are you wanting to write and direct or just focus on mainly kind of writing stuff and hopefully getting it produced by someone else? Yeah, I mean, yeah, kind of like like I said, man, I think if I could write and direct with, a, with an actual cast and crew, that could be a crew that could really, I would love that. Yeah. But if it's coming to the point where it's okay, super low budget, I don't mind doing it, but I might step away. Cause I, I really, I, I love writing just cause there's no stress. There's no money involved. It's you and a keyboard and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I would love to write and direct, but under the right circumstances, like not that I'm above it by any means. I just love it, man. I, yeah. love, it, I love it, but it's like, like it just this movie single handed took off. Like I think 10 years of my life. Cause it's been every day, nonstop, man, nonstop. And again, I think a lot of people don't focus on writing as much as they should. I'm one of them. Yeah, man. Yeah. And that, that that's single-handedly changed, I think, my entire trajectory of my career is switching gears, not focusing on keeping up with the technology, but yeah, returning the story and just reading as much as I can and writing yeah. as much as I can. Like that changed a lot of things. So I think you'd kind of like this. Is I, I guess I didn't say this on the forum. I was gonna post it on screenwriting forum too. But what I think is fucking cool, which I'm really proud about, is the fact that so I didn't even tell my producing partner, but I simultaneously submitted dash the film to film festivals and at the same time submitted to the dash the screenplay to screenplay festivals right oh, right because okay. i've always like i've i've never been able to crack that that screenwriting contest code i'm not going to say it's complete worship but like there's something that i just don't get where i've submitted dozens of times to the, yeah. the tv shows i've written or films that i've written yeah. nothing i think i've advanced one time and I'm like, I just like... don't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So I submitted and Dash is getting in all these film festivals. The film, yeah. the screenwriting competition didn't even advance once, not even advanced. But which yeah. I hope that gives people hope is like, because that was me. I was stuck in that loop for five years of just, I wrote nonstop submitting to these festivals and got nothing. I gave them my $50 and they said, okay, thank you, bye. Yeah. So like, that to me is like really, like I hope that gives some people like inspiration that, don't let them pe- those people tell you no it's probably some dude that hired off craigslist to read you know a script for 20 bucks so like, yeah. don't let that disturb you so that's uh, to me i'm proud of the fact that i'm glad that it didn't advance anywhere yeah that kind of proves the point that nobody knows shit like that's yeah. the thing how would the with the writing process how does that work for you so do you read kind of novels do you read are you a big believer in um reading screenwriting books and story writing books mm-hmm. and stuff like that yeah so i love talking about it because like i said that's what i spend most of my time doing but uh no, I think, you know, I did, I have read all the books in my early 20s. That was like, I, you yeah. know, we all read Save the Cat. That was yeah. a story. And I've re- I have all those books in my shelves. But yeah. uh, I, I wish I liked reading novels. It's just never been my medium. I think I, I read plenty of screenplays, which is funny, but I just don't, novels for me, just, I, I don't know. I, I'm, a, I'm a movie guy. So that that's you. So you, you, you kind of focus mainly on just reading screenplays. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, just digesting exactly how, why they're working, why certain scenes are working, why certain scenes aren't working. And yeah. I wish I could show you my shelves, but I have like 600 screenplays on the shelves right now. I actually oh, acquired my. a collection from a guy here in Hollywood. Oh, but, uh, that's cool. It was actually a 7,000 screenplay collection, but my girlfriend's like, you cannot keep 7,000. <laughs> no, it would have filled this entire room. Yeah, that's my wife would be the same. She'd be like, no chance. <laughs> <laughs> no, not happening. But no, I think, you know, I think from a writing perspective it just it's fun to try new things not necessarily things that you're aware of but to me the beauty of that and like 
than not having the stress is, you know, and then getting people together to read it close, close friends that would tell you this is garbage. Why, why would you say that? That I think has been the biggest helpful aspect of my writing is writing it, but not just, they said, blindly submitting to festivals and letting it, letting it sit in the shelf, but mm -hmm. writing something. And I, again, it was, we turned into a party where it's like, you get 10 people together, you have a read through and people just dis dissect the hell out of it and say, it was slow here. It didn't work here. This was great. And you can see in real time how people react to your words, which helps, I think, so, so, so much because you're not just in your own head. How do you go about writing it? And then do you kind of just do a draft, go with someone or, you know, do you write a couple of scenes or an outline and then sort of watch it? Yeah. yeah. My process, I mean, it's so I typically, I'm a fan of like the vomit draft. I, I, yeah. I love doing stuff like that, just getting it on the page. But before I ever put a word on my, a finger on my keyboard, I spend, I let the story simmer. I outline the hell out of it. I story block it. I do everything I possibly can just to dissect every single tiny beat. So when I get to the actual writing part, it's just all, let's have some fun. The story, the hard work's done, but I sp I, it's probably hard. I spend more time scrutinizing over the structure because I think, you know, especially screenplays are so structure based. Not that it has to follow a certain structure, but it has to be an engaging story. So I spend so much more time just outlining and pairing that story yeah. And so when I get to the keyboard, it flies. Usually it takes me about a week to write and then it's done. Yeah. It's great. No, that's a good it's worked for me. It's not everybody's process like that. I found that helpful for me. It just scrutinize over the structure and themes and all that stuff. But then yeah. so when you get to the keyboard, it's just all fun. You know, because it's funny. I actually like looked down here and I saw that I have my notepad of all the draft stuff, which you can see yeah. just so cool. nonstop, man. It's, that's cool. Yeah. You'll have to uh, like, yeah, sign that and put it on, like, frame it. Uh, sell it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hold on to it. yeah. Yeah, hold on to it until it gets big out and out there. So that'd be cool. How many kind of drafts do you go through, or what's your general time frame on? We'll say for Dash for now, just because that's what you focused on recently. But like, what's your process with that? How 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 did you go about that? Was it like you wrote a draft and then went for a read through? How many times did you go through redrafting? How, how long did that take overall? Yeah, I think actually Dash surprisingly was a script that I've rewritten the least, the absolute least. I think the first draft, it's the first draft is very close to what was on the screen. All right. uh, I think there was a couple, I think some like major, just, I guess just dialogue changes was the only thing uh, and maybe some little nuanced things to kind of help carry things and build tension. But Dash was very, I, I think because we were so excited to shoot a movie that like, I knew that I didn't have the time to like piss around. It's like, get yeah. this done. I, luckily, it just, I got really lucky, I guess. But that came from, like I said, years of doing research and preparation and getting rejected by everybody. But yeah, I mean, it was fairly quick, man. I wish I had like, oh man, painstakingly every word went over. It took a year. But no, it was very quick. Because I've been there where I've done 12 drafts. I'm going to say, drafts yeah, exactly. It's so funny, man. I've been there. I've been there. Yeah, that's the other part is how long you've been writing for. Because again, that that's a massive craft in itself. In this process, are you writing your own stuff to to get produced, or have you got stuff already that you've written before Dash that you want to get produced, or looking at? Like... Yeah, that's actually a funny question because I think especially Dash is you know, it shows that typically when I write, I would write stuff that I know I could shoot cheaply. You know, so like that. I, always in the back of my mind I had budget you know being the you know producer and director knowing yeah the realities of the situation but now I'm in a phase you know with this project I'm running for somebody else now where they're like no budget's not an option just like think freely I'm like that's I, that's wild to me you know that's wild I think I wrote I wrote one outlandish script about like a, like a pretty much just Mad Max but in modern times like a giant car chase oh. uh and that was outlandish but I think to me it was fun just to pour that out yeah. I think for the most part, man, I would always write knowing that, okay, it's most likely going to be me shooting this and you don't have no money. So write cheaply, like make it happen. Yeah. If you could give one piece of advice, what would that be? Mm -hmm. That's so, dude, it's so surreal to be asked that question because I've <laughs> asked that so many times and I've read so Finally many there. answers to that. Yeah, and it's, there. and I think the answers would always frustrate me because it's, it is that simple of like, just do it. Like, don't let things stop you. Just make it happen keep going, you know, persevere. Like that's, that's all it takes. Not that I'm, people should be listening to my advice necessarily, but like it, it's worked for me to get to this juncture is like never letting anything, especially your own head prevent you from stopping, you know, just keep going, man. Like it's a lot of rejection, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of frustration, but if you keep going, man, eventually something will probably happen. 
as big yeah. as you want it? Probably not, but something will eventually happen. Yeah. And like I said, really? and that's why I pride myself in, man, is like having zero industry connections, knowing nobody in this business, having no money and like still getting this level. To me, that's really cool. So like along those lines, I'll also say is I have like an obsessive work ethic where I, if I'm not doing stuff to advance this project or other projects, then like I get some sort of anxiety, which is probably to a fault because I work probably too much. Yeah. But uh, you have like, if you if you want to get better, you can't just say okay, things are gonna things are gonna happen if I keep trying. But you have to try more as well. Like, you have to yeah. keep trying. Yeah. Like not fool yourself that okay, I'm at least giving. You know, I wrote a script this year. Write two, write three. Like, yeah, like, exactly. Push yourself. Push yourself. Yeah. And I, it's funny because I think I treat it because I get why people treat it as like this mystical art form. But I think where I grew up and how I was raised, I have a very blue collar work ethic. I had to work construction for 10 years. So yeah. when I sit down to write, it's like, get it done, man. Like, get it done. And I think there was an awesome interviewer, George R. R. Martin, was interviewing Stephen King. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I, I set a goal. Like, I have to hit five pages a day. And like, I yeah. just do it. I got, it's a job, you know, it's like, get it done. I think like this project, you know, Dash tested my, because like I said, I think I pride myself. I'm not the smartest man. I'm not the most talented or gifted or creative man, but I will work until I can't work anymore. So yeah. I think Dash pushed me more than anything where it's like, oh my, I said, I spent a month just, you know, grading that dude's hands. Like I, that's what I think, you know, separates certain people and like the people that I admire that I can, that I want to continue working with are the ones that are just like, it's not just like a hobby for them. Like this is it. Like, and like, like I said, an obsessive work ethic of not accepting, you know, mediocrity and just keep pushing and going, knowing that your next project isn't going to be the best, but it's going to be better and keep yeah. trying to strive to be better, I guess. That's great. Um, thank you for your time, Sean. Um, this has been fun, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to seeing what I hope so, man. I don't have a heart attack. If I don't have a heart attack in the next couple of weeks, <laughs> trying to bang out another, I have to bang out another script by like next Thursday. So it's like, oh, wow. It's overworking myself so much, man. Like, yeah. so, so much, which is exciting, but like, it's, it gets to be exhausting. Would you, would you change anything? Would you, in terms of where you're at now, is there anything you'd change? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, for the, I mean, because I think a lot of people are like, because I, I didn't move to New York. I didn't leave my small town until I was 27. So right. that was kind of like, I wish, a part of me is like, I wish I would have left to New York earlier. But then, no, because it does, I mean, some of the best memories I have and some of the stories I want to tell surround those moments. And I'm not a city guy to begin with. So, no, I, I think maybe... I would say I wish I would have came to LA sooner from New York. Uh, I yeah. think there's just much more work out here, and uh, just it's with a good work ethic, it's much easier to stand out out here. It's like in New York, everybody's killing themselves and working so hard. Yeah, but out here, everybody's going to the beach and wants to hang out and just be seen. That's not my cup of tea. So like, yeah. maybe I would say that, but for the most part, no. Because then I met my girlfriend in New York, and some of the best members I have were in New York. I don't know. I don't. I really don't know. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Honestly, I really appreciate it. I really, I really enjoyed this conversation, Liam. Thank you so, so much. No, that's cool. And I look forward to keeping in touch for real. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll let you go, man. I, obviously, you're busy. Yeah, if you have any other questions, yeah, reach out anytime. You have the email, yeah, reach out whenever. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, man. All right, Sean. Yeah, keep at it, dude. I, I really look forward to seeing what you come up with. Take Thanks, care, man. Thanks. Take Bye care. Later.